Hey, somebody's got to recount the ballots. I mean, all the ballots. You already have? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to the Professional Noticer. First thing I'd like to know is what subject is this? Here, you and I will use common sense and all the wisdom we can muster to move beyond what is true and go all the way to the truth, creating measurable results for people like you and families like yours. No longer a member of the amateur ranks, I am the Professional Noticer. Stay with us, folks. Things could break any minute now, but right now, uh, back to our regular program. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. While our topics might seem to vary wildly at times, it's because the things you care about most are often greatly affected by the things you care about least. Therefore, we will field the more serious questions in life about business and spiritual issues, popular culture, and we'll work with some crazy questions too, like why are bread slices square but sandwich meat is round? (laughs) My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or a coach. I want to help you live the life you would live if all your toughest questions were answered. The Professional Noticer is sponsored this week by our friends at Talker ATV, where the variety of power sport products will just blow your mind. Second to none. I mean, yeah, they carry the Hustler turf equipment, these unbelievable zero-turn mowers. It's just unbelievable. The, the entire line of Echo Power Tools, and yes, Tucker ATV, carries every make and model of Polaris ATVs and the big Polaris side-by-sides, the Ranger Crew. That's what I have is the Ranger crew. But you have to see the showroom to believe this place. All right, the taxidermy, the antique displays, along with the customer service porch. This porch is just unbelievable with its swing, uh, comfortable chairs, free coffee, and a huge television set. This is just the start. But when you stop in, Shannon or Lisa Tucker, sometimes Shannon and Lisa, will greet you personally. They treat customers like family, which is why folks from 14 states do business with Tucker ATV. Visit the Tucker ATV Facebook page or visit Shannon and Lisa in person. The showroom is on Highway 43 North in Jackson, Alabama. Tucker ATV, the small town business with the national reputation. Observations and answers. That's what we do here. I deliver the observations and you provide the questions. Because we need answers in our lives, it's the questions that are actually the critical component of the person you and I aspire to become. Remember, the quality of your answers can only be determined by the quality of your questions. And this week, we have a couple of great questions. Our first question is, is from Martin. He lives in Indiana. Let's listen. Hi, Andy. This is Martin from Indiana. Um, I'm sure in your business you come across difficult people all the time. How do you deal with it? More specifically, I mean, how do you feel with difficult people? Uh, People with bad attitudes, people who are always pessimistic and negative, people who are only listening to respond, not really listening to resolve. I really hope you have time to answer this because I'm dealing with it right now and not too successfully either. Uh, thanks. Okay, Martin from Indiana. <laughs> Man, I, I, well, we all know. We all know exactly what you're talking about. I was in the airport yesterday and was looking at this rack of books, and there were, I don't know, four or five books on like dealing with difficult people. And so I always think, you know, when I see something like that, I, I think, well, they obviously weren't all written at the same time. And so, you know, one of them came out first and that didn't work. And then another one came out and boy, that didn't work either. And so somebody wrote another one. This is an ongoing thing. I 
you know, I'm guessing dealing with difficult people is as old as Adam and Eve. I mean, don't, don't you think at, at some point, you know, Adam went, you did what? Ser- seriously, you did what? And, and then, of course, then he did it. And then, you know, Eve's probably looking at him and going, well, you moron. Yeah, I, but now, now we're both in trouble. And so I, I don't know. They were probably difficult. Like Cain and Abel, they were certainly difficult. Somebody was difficult there. And so this has been going on forever. I think, Martin, that you have listed two different situations here. When I hear your message, I think that people with bad attitudes, people who are negative, I think those people, that's a category. And then I think that the people who are only listening to respond, they're not really listening to resolve anything. They're only listening to respond. I think that's a totally different category. I think that people with bad attitudes, man, you know, I think probably people with bad attitudes, probably a different category of people that are pessimistic. A pessimist, a lot of times you can just kind of chuckle at that. You know, you just kind of, I mean, you know, you're at work and when you go to the break room, you know, somebody says, hey, hurry up, drink your coffee before Eeyore gets here. And everybody laughs and and yeah, it's not really a big deal. It doesn't really uh, affect everybody because they're they're just kind of naturally that way, or they've and I say naturally they have chosen over the years to become that way. But I have seen people who are pessimistic that have a little perspective put in their lives and manage to turn that around. I think it's an awesome thing that you can do to help somebody who is just pessimistic. Now, I will tell you this. I have never met a pessimistic person that would admit to being pessimistic. I'm telling you, I heard this, I heard somebody say this the other day. Every time if somebody says, well, you know, I'm really more an optimist, but you, whew, I mean, you're a pessimist. I've never heard anybody that admitted to it because they said, I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. That's what they say. You know, I, I want to say, well, <laughs> you know, what, whatever world that is that you're living in, it may be real to you, but I want to stay as far away from it as I possibly can. Pessimists, you can usually just kind of, you can kind of live with them. Yeah. Now, oh, wait a minute. I didn't mean to say it like that. You can work in the same office with them. It is hard to live with them. And I think that, you know, I've talked sometimes to couples who, you know, one of them over the years has developed like a pessimistic attitude. And I'm trying to think, it seems to me that every time I've seen this, if you ask the other person, you know, was he always like this? Has she always been like this? And it it seems like they always say, no, no. And so, you know, sometimes I've asked the person, do you think that you see a more dangerous side of something, a more, you know, the worst side of something? Do you think you do that? And and a lot of times I go, well, you know, I I guess I, you know, I've just had some things happen and I just, you know, I don't want to build my hopes up and, and um, but I think that, I think that somebody like that that you can you can talk to, and I think there's not necessarily a screw loose or something. They've just kind of taken a they've gone down a trail that that's kind of what they see. But I think that person can be guided back to the main road. I think that you know there is a a point in that person's life, you know. Let me. Do you want to be like this? Now I'll tell you this. This, you know that that is not a question. That do you want to be like this? That is not a question a husband can ask a wife. <laughs> okay, that's not a question a wife can ask a husband. And things are just going to deteriorate. I'm mean, saying so you, you know, somebody's going to get mad, and 
yet that is a question a friend can ask a friend. That is a question a buddy can ask a buddy. And I'll tell you, my wife and I, Polly and I, have a very open understanding that, uh, okay, dear, you know that sometimes, you know, I, I have a lot of faults, but I... I still feel like a kid. I want to impress you. And so when when you are saying something's wrong with me, it makes me defensive. It makes me nervous. And yet Kevin Perkins, Mike Chikubik, Todd Rainsbury, there's a lot of people like that that, I mean, we can be walking in the street and, you know, Todd could say, boy, you are sure acting like an idiot. And, you know, I don't really take any offense at that at all. And so Polly and I have a very open understanding. Hey, if something's, you know, if, if I'm doing something or I'm not, you know, seeing something, if I have some blind spot in my life, feel free to call Kevin and tell him, to call, you know, Joe and tell him, call, call Sandy, call, you know, call Ty and say, hey, you need to get with, and, and so... Sometimes just figuring out who needs to talk to somebody is, is the the good the good way to handle it. People with bad attitudes, that's a step down though. People with bad attitudes tend to have anger mixed with their pessimism. And anger is usually more deeply seated. And sometimes that can be handled with a friend, but it has to be a friend with authority in that person's life. Anger has something to do with an unforgiving kind of spirit, a kind of bitterness thing. And so a lot of times, you know, if if a person has a spiritual life, they can be talked to in that fashion by somebody who is given authority in their life, not somebody who necessarily has it. I'm not talking about a boss. I'm talking about somebody that they listen to. And so that's, again, I don't think that's something that can be handled, not easily anyway, between a couple. All right. But the last one, this is very curious because you you talk about, Martin, you talk about uh, people who are only listening to respond. They're not really listening to resolve. I got to tell you, when I sense that, I just, I don't do anything with them. If you confront somebody about that, they just deny it. See, when when you said that, you know, people were only listening to respond, not really listening to resolve. I'm not seeing this as some argument, okay? I'm not seeing this as somebody's, you know, they're just listening to figure out a way to yak back. I'm seeing, and and what I see a lot of times, what, what I'm imagining as you say that is people who they think they know everything or they think they know everything about that subject. And most times you ask how I deal with it, you know, I meet a lot of people where I have the occasion to spend a short amount of time with a lot of people. And when I sense somebody doing that, and I know this is how they see themselves. This is who they are to themselves. They already know nobody's going to tell them anything. And it's certainly not going to be me. And so, yeah. What they say about you don't want to try to teach a pig to sing because it's really hard. to It'll frustrate you, but it'll make the pig mad. <laughs> and, and the pig's not going to sing anyway. And so I kind of let those go. I, I had a situation a couple of weeks ago. I had been in a group of people, a small group of people, just several people talking, and I really liked this guy that was there, and I heard him say, you know, he referenced a couple of things that I thought, now this is just me, right? I mean, he didn't ask me, but I really liked him, and I thought, you know what? I need to get in a conversation with him before I get out of here 
because that's something that can dramatically affect his life if he doesn't understand it. And, uh, you know, maybe I have a conversation with him and, and we can kind of cover it. And so I, I did. I arranged. I, I said, I said, hey, before I get out of here, I'm, I know I'm running to the airport in a little bit. But, man, I would love to can we just sit down for a few minutes and ask you a couple of questions and just hang out and get to know you a little better. He said, oh, sure, absolutely, you know. And so where this was was like at a business. And I was in the room first. And the guy who was going to drive me to the airport was in the room. And I went in and I, it was a conference table. I sat on the side. I don't ever go sit at the end. You know, when there's a lot of chairs available, I ain't never sitting in the end. If I walk into a room and every single chair is already taken and the only one left is the end of the table, I will sit there, but I will always say something like, no, wait a minute, you guys want me to be the daddy? Do I have to be the daddy today and sit here? You know, because uh, there is um, something that speaks very loudly to me when there are other seats at the table and somebody comes in and they sit at the end. And this guy came in and he sat at the end. And I already was getting kind of an odd feeling. I asked a couple of questions and he told me everything about this. And even when I questioned, I I said, well, no, what if so-and-so happens? Well, he told me about that too. And I realized very quickly that this guy is giving me answers. He's not looking for answers. You know, Martin, you and I should always be looking for answers because I think there's a lot of danger uh, financially, uh, with relationships, I think there's a lot of danger in being the one who has all the answers. And, of course, you know, here I sit in front of a microphone and I'm giving you an answer. (laughs) So I do think about this a lot because I think that, you know, you and I are not alone, Martin, that we, we all deal with difficult people. But here's here's something to remember, too. I always try to keep in mind, yeah, I deal with a lot of difficult people, but sometimes the people that love me the most, I am difficult for them. I know that. You know, there's nobody in the world that I love more than I love my wife, and there's nobody in the world who's probably more difficult for her to deal with than me. We, you know, coming up on being married 30 years, we know each other very well. We're very comfortable. And sometimes, you know, you you get too comfortable and you say things you shouldn't say. And you press opinions you shouldn't press. And so just one of the things to remember as you're, that, that I would urge you to remember is dealing with people with bad attitudes. Yeah, we we deal with people with bad attitudes. And I don't know about you, but me, I've I've had several times in my life, I've had a bad attitude about one thing or another. You know, people who are pessimistic, people who are negative. I've had had times in my life that I have uh, either been called out for being pessimistic, negative, or I kind of figured myself I am, am being this way. And there have been times in my life where I'm acting like the guy at the end of the table and I know all the answers and I don't want to hear anything else anybody has to say. And so as as you and I navigate this with difficult people, we can have a little empathy, not sympathy. We can have some empathy with them because if you're anything like me, Martin, you know, we have both been difficult too, occasionally. Of course, you and me, it hadn't been very often, right? But anyway... Uh, Hey, thanks so much for the question. You know, I appreciate you guys listening so much. I appreciate your your questions. 
And I appreciate so much that the feedback we get from you when you uh, review this on iTunes, I so much appreciate your positive reviews. This is how they kind of notice you. And, um, you know, we got a show called The Professional Noticer and, and would help to be noticed. The Professional Noticer was really an opportunity that you and I share together every week. You know, it's a quick half hour dedicated to harnessing common sense and wisdom. This is what we're after, man. Common sense and wisdom in order to plow through an issue all the way to an answer for you and you and you and you and you. Our second question today is from Dwayne in North Carolina. Let's listen. My name is Dwayne. I'm from New Bern, North Carolina. And my question is, how can I take what I've learned from the little things and all the other books that Andy has written that I've read and put them to better action? Dwayne, thank you for the question. I, I'm very I'm very grateful that you, you are reading the books. I, I, I think there is a lot to take from the little things. But I got I got to say this, my answer is going to be based on your reading in general, okay? Because I'm assuming you're reading something besides me. You should be, <laughs> and uh, but I am grateful that you're you're reading these books and that we are connecting through this. I think the very first thing that is critical that you do is to put as as you read, put yourself in the the position of one character or another. This is what what I really do so that I can get uh, somewhat emotionally involved in, in what's happening. And I can feel that answer or I can feel that question. And so I can begin to explore it myself. You know, I also think it's important to go back and look at certain pieces that you thought, you know, that they hit you at that point. You know, the old game that used to be played where people would uh, sit around in a circle, be like 12 people in a circle, and somebody whispers something to somebody, and then they whisper to the next person, they whisper, and by the time it gets around, it's a totally different thing. You, You remember that? Well, I think we do that to ourselves a lot of times if we're not careful especially if we're reading something that has an intention or a purpose beyond entertainment. And the reason I think we do that is because I think that wherever we are, the situation we're in, how we feel, who's around us, what we got to do in a few minutes, it has a bearing on how we retain or consider or view what we have just read. And then we take our life and basically whisper it around the room for the next couple of days, and somehow it it can change. And so I think it's important to make sure that message, that thing that you really want to take away, that the message remains pure. Now, again, I'm I'm not necessarily talking about me. I'm talking about you know what whatever you read with the intention of of growing and understanding more i think you need to circle back to certain parts of it now the only way i know to do this is with a highlighter and i find a couple of different things about this that are very interesting at least to me i can think of things that i like i'll read sometimes on airplanes if i'm on a trip and i'll come home and i've got several things that i want to read to polly and talk with her and discuss with her or or a couple things maybe i want to read to austin or adam or something i want to you know that the guys in my office and i need to we need to figure on this and i'm the worst in the world at going back in the book and trying to find that place. It's just, it's aggravating, especially, you know, you're sitting there, hey, hey, I got I got something that I want, I want to read. Or, you know, you get to a place, you go, now what was that again? And then you sit there and you just can't find it. And so I have learned through the years that an incredible tool for me is a highlighter. Now, not just so that I can go back. You know, it's not just so that I can go back and find a certain 
place. It's like a bow if you're going hunting. I mean, there's one attitude that you have or there's one thought process you have if you're just walking through the woods. But if you're walking through the woods with your bow and, you know, your family is going to be hungry if you don't bring home some giant cabbage or something that you shot, you know, and so you, you're going through the woods in a different manner with a different thought process when you're going to bring home food for your family. Maybe that's not, not a good example, but that's what that highlighter does for me. I look at the woods differently when I'm carrying a bow. And I look at words differently and phrases, and I look at uh, paragraphs and concepts and principles much differently with a highlighter in my hand than I do when I don't have a highlighter in my hand. And I've gotten so used to doing that that sometimes if I find myself without a highlighter, it just makes it kind of hard for me because I think, oh my gosh, I got to remember this. And, you know, I'm dog ear in the book. And uh, now I got to tell you, statistics indicate that by uh, a huge margin, people do not read with a highlighter. All right. And so I, you know, I'm just saying, Dwayne, to me, if you don't have a one of these colored markers in your fist or in your teeth like a cigar, if you don't have one, you, if you don't read one, you are part of a massive majority. So there you go. You can be happy being a part of the majority as long as you enjoy being a part of the majority. I am of the opinion that the uh, majority, while they might do fine, they don't do great often and almost never go best right? I mean, you, you got the majority. So like, like think of a bunch of lemmings. Okay. So one here, here's one lemming saying to another, Hey, you think too much. Why, why are you thinking? I mean, why would everybody be running this way if it weren't the right direction? I think that's what lemmings say to each other. And if I had written that somewhere, you could highlight it, but it's just a thought that, it, that I have had before that, you know, I immediately begin to investigate something mentally if I find out that a lot most people don't do it. And so it, you know, it's true. Most people read without a highlighter. But the choice to read with one or to not read with one is that's yours. Okay. But I would like to point out to you there is a passive way to receive information, and there's an aggressive way. Now, your question, you said, how can I best take what I've learned from books. How can I best take this and how can I put the material I've learned to better action? Okay, well, I think the way that you can do that best is by taking that knowledge and developing that knowledge into wisdom. You know, that is two different things, right? And, uh, you know, there's tons of people that have knowledge, but they don't have wisdom. I saw a, a, uh, a definition the other day of wisdom, and the definition of wisdom that I saw was a deeper understanding of principle. Okay, so if you think of knowledge, well, there's a lot of people that have, you know, a knowledge of a principle, this one or that one. But wisdom would be not just an awareness and maybe not just a basic understanding of principle, but according to this definition, wisdom would be a deeper understanding of principle. Now, curiously, this is where you go when you start highlighting stuff because that, that allows you to go back to it several times and think beyond what is true, to go to the bottom of the pool, to get down and get to the foundation. It's a, and so here's what has occurred to me is that if wisdom is a deeper 
understanding of principle. Okay, well, okay, that's a point that you've you've reached. Now you have a deeper understanding of principle. But you know what comes after a deeper understanding of principle is a deeper understanding. And after a deeper understanding, evidently there is a place that you can go that would be called a deeper understanding. I, you know, according to this definition, it did not say wisdom is a point of definitive understanding of the principle. It says deeper understanding of the principle, which that just kind of goes on and on, which is fine. You know, I, I said that there's a passive way for somebody to read something and receive new information in an aggressive way. And see, reading with a highlighter is an aggressive way. That's purpose-driven. So if at least a part of the reason you're reading stuff, and and it is, you know, I mean, you, you ask, how can I best take what I've learned from the books I read and put that material to better action? Okay, so part of the reason you read is to gain greater understanding and harness the power of what you're learning. Well, that big pen in your hand as you're reading is a reminder that you're not just passing time. I mean, you're reading with the aggressive intention of striking gold. You are finding and marking a specific thought, a principle, an idea in order to return to that place as often and as easily as as you desire to continue to contemplate it, to get a deeper understanding. You know, reading reading without a highlighter in your hand is kind of like being an antique collector at an auction without any money. Yeah, you'll see a lot of stuff. You know, most likely you, you'll stop to admire things, okay? But at the end of the day, your collection of antiques is not worth any more than it was at the first of the day because you never bought anything. Yeah, I mean, a a month later, you might remember that uh, that very cool roll-up desk you saw. You you know, that Revolutionary War era teapot. It may occasionally cross your mind, but you won't sit at the desk. You're never going to sip the tea that's brewed in that two-and-a-half-century-old teapot. Because you don't own them. And the chances are, because that moment slipped away, you never will. Does that make sense? Have I beaten this point to death for you? (laughs) Good. Then go get your highlighter. I think that's the beginning of it, Dwayne. Thank you for the question, man. Thank you so much. And this has been fun. But I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I am harnessing the tiny bit of mental energy I have for you, seeking wisdom, making observations, trying to get that deeper understanding of principle and answering some tough questions in a way that I hope will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, smile while you talk, okay? Shake hands with the kids you meet. And make sure you have an answer to the question, how can something really be new and improved? If a product is new, what has the company improved? Hmm. It's going to take some time to figure. But for now, until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme written and performed by Sugarcane J. Stamp licking provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration provided by IHaveARight.com Providing legal services for the people who irritate us in so many ways simply because they have a right to do so. 
from riding a bicycle in traffic, holding up a mile-long line of cars who can't get around them, to screaming obscenities at a football game while families sit nearby with their children and just take it. IHaveARight.com protects the rights of everyone from the merely obnoxious to the unbelievably infuriating. IHaveARight.com wants you to remember that while everyone must be tolerant of your behavior, you don't have to tolerate anyone or anything at all. So call IHaveARight.com the next time you are offended. IHaveARight.com the organization for incredibly selfish people.